Good morning, Melbourne, and welcome to the third AWS Melbourne Dev Day. It is awesome to see you all here. Thank you so much for making the time for what I'm sure is going to be an incredible day of learning. Well, as many of you know, developers have been very much at the core of everything we've done at AWS, going all the way back to 2006, when we launched our first services, SQS and S3, that were made available to developers through a simple API call. Well, since then, it's been incredible to see that um, developers and the builders in this room have played a, an integral role in innovation in, in every aspect of life here in Australia, in terms of the enterprises and how they transform, and startups, and, and things like medical research. And you've enabled us to build the platform that it is today, with over 125 services. Everything from machine learning, really advanced analytics, uh, tools, IoT, and a whole raft of other things still available to developers through a simple API call. And we all know that the pace of innovation is increasing in really, really dramatic ways. At AWS, in the last 12 months, we've released 1,430 new services. That's three, well over three new services a day and coupled with a whole series of investments in tools designed for developer productivity, things like plugins and SDKs that hopefully enable you to build incredible new applications uh, in compelling ways and iterate the applications you've already built in, in new and interesting ways. But in addition to platform and tooling, the other thing we're deeply passionate about at AWS is this idea of community. And it's been incredible to see how this community has evolved and developed not just over the last 12 years, um, but especially in the last three years. And when we think about the investments that we're making and the commitment to this community, we think about it across a couple of different dimensions. One of those is learning, and we see skills as being critical, events like this one here today, but also things like our Dev Lounge series, Dev Workshop series. But we also think that the notion of the community itself and the ability to learn from each other is also important, which is why we continue to invest, hopefully at scale, in effective ways in things like meetups and hackathons and game days. But we also think that if we think together, we can play a really important role in solving for some really, really big opportunities. And I think one of those is continuing to drive ever-increasing diversity and cognitive diversity into this community. Because without it, our ability to solve problems as a community is going to diminish over time. So really big opportunity that we all have in front of us. And in that vein of learning, um, I'm really proud that the team have put together an incredible agenda for you. It's been many months in the making, covering all of the topics that hopefully you're here to hear about, things like containers, machine learning, um, continuing the thread around securing your workloads, and of course, this, this huge topic uh, around leveraging the power of your data. And so that we hope by the end of today, what you leave with is hopefully a bunch of new ideas, hopefully some skills, but most importantly, a renewed passion and vigor to go out and build some really, really cool stuff. So I'd like to, to say a big thank you to our sponsors today, Intel, NAB, and New Relic, because without them, it would be really impossible for us to put on an event of this scale for free. So let's join in, in offering our sponsors a big round of applause. Thank you. And with that, it's now my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today, the Head of Emerging Technologies for AWS in APAC, Olivia Klein. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm really excited today because I want to talk about what our, us as developers really matters. You know, how do we build things? What are the new strategies? What are the methodologies? How do we integrate? How do we abstract? How do we port? How do we deliver it to potentially all of your devices right here in the room later in a live demo? And to be frank, it's, the software development component is really changing. It has been changing, and it keeps changing. And cloud computing is partially driving that. Now, if you think about it, the first thing that really has changed is the fact that everything becomes more data-centric. Data is our new goal. We can actually create complete businesses on data. So we want to be aware of that as developers. 
But the other thing that's important is abstraction and integration. APIs, microservices, SDKs, open source, frameworks that are out there, all important for us to be successful in building our platforms, building our applications. And we want to have a look today at some of the strategies on how we can properly integrate microservices together, for example. The other thing is portability. We probably have some phones in our pockets. We have some tablets. I got a laptop here. I got another tablet there. I'm going to use that for a live demo later. We want to build an application once and then port it across. How do we do that effectively? And what are the strategies here? And the other thing that I'd say is things start to connect. Everything starts to connect. It's not just IoT. It's distributed computing on all the devices that you have. No matter if it's your phone or your laptop or your computer or your car or your camera or whatever it is. And all of this is happening at a rapid pace of innovation. And so I, I want to address those four points today and back it up with a variety of live demos to understand how that really works. So let's start off with data centricity. If I say data centricity, what do I mean with that? You know, the way we do things from an IT perspective, from a developer's perspective, has changed. In the olden world, we were there to support functions, right? No matter if it's a marketing function or the employees at work, we were there to just keep the lights on, make people have access to things and let, things work, let people and employees work. In the new world, everything starts to connect. Everyone is able to connect to different kind of systems and interact and collaborate with each other. And this needs to tie into any kind of different channels. No matter if it's connected devices, no matter if it's your sales channels, no matter if it's your factories or your supply chains, no matter if it's social media, your employees at work or your sales force, all of it needs to talk to each other. And why? Because that's what our end consumers will expect from us as a company or if we're a startup, our end users. And so what has changed for me as a developer? Well, the first thing is that it's not OK to run a report at the end of the month. You want to derive insights really, really quickly. And I would go as far as saying it is crucial for the success of your business that you make use of the insights that you can derive from any data point that you collect and any data point that's out there in the ecosystem that you can tap onto. Now, there are a few moving forces. The first one is data keeps growing, exponentially larger at a high velocity and high volume. It has been doing that for many years, and that's not going to stop. It's just going to accelerate. We have more complex data structures, right? Traditionally, you might just have a data warehouse, some files lying around. That has changed. A lot of data structures can be extremely complex. Nowadays, we treat video material as a new data structure that we use for data analytics. So let's have a look at what we can do about that. And so one thing that I would say and urge anyone in this room, no matter if you're an IT professional executive, and especially if you're a developer, don't do that collect later thing. Right? Don't think about it later on. Decide to bring data analytics into your application from day one. What that means is your applications that you're building should directly feed a data analytics pipeline, no matter what it is. It's a mobile application, web application, you know, if it's an application that sits on an IoT device. Think about a strategy to collect as many data points that could be relevant in the future, even if you don't necessarily know about its use case right now yet. The other thing is, if you're an architect, design an architecture in a matter that compute and storage is disconnected and decoupled, so not disconnected, Decoupled, don't disconnect it. Connected is important. Decouple it. What I mean with that is store your data somewhere, but don't store it on a running server. Store it on a storage service, something like an Amazon S3 bucket. And then whenever you want to run an analytics query, only then you run an analytics query. And by the way, if you do it on an EC2 instance, spot instances are really, really cool for doing such computational workloads because you can get access at highly discounted rates of those EC2, rates, EC2 instances. The other thing that I would say is don't be afraid of data transformation. You know, sometimes we think too much about the structures on how should we collect this piece of information so that I can derive insights out of it. Sometimes you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what query you want to run later, and you're not sure yet about what are the insights that you want to derive. That's OK. Just store it somewhere first. Data transformation is not costly. You can do it fast and effectively with the right tools nowadays, no matter how large that data grows. Now, what that means for you, though, is define a structure of services that help you build such a data analytics pipeline. What that means is you want to have some central point where you store, 
If you, if you want to call it a data lake, call it a data lake. If you want to call it your data-centric platform, call it a data-centric platform. But you want to have one single source of truth, which very often can sit, I would recommend, in an Amazon S3 bucket. And from there, you can move data in from various different sources, no matter if it's your relational databases, no matter if it's your NoSQL or DynamoDB databases, no matter if it's your caches. And AWS Glue can help with that transformation. The other thing and the other reason why we want to have Amazon S3 as a central point is because it allows us to move data in and out really quickly, even down to the level of physical, uh, physical devices, such as Snowball or Snowball Edges or even trucks, such as snowmobiles, to move petabytes of data in and out of your Amazon S3 bucket really quickly, but also move them in really quickly. So it gives us that flexibility of moving data around easily at a very cost-effective rate. And the other thing I mentioned, decouple, compute, and storage. What do I mean with that? Well, if your data sits in an Amazon S3 bucket, you can actually run SQL queries of that S3 bucket straight away using services such as Amazon Athena. Or if you run a Hadoop or system or Amazon EMR or Spark, you can run that query off your S3 bucket. Now you decoupled compute and storage because you only bring that cluster up when you need it, Athena, you don't even need to bring up a cluster. You just run the query. We do that work for you. And if you want to use data warehousing technology, Amazon Redshift, great data warehouse solution. With Redshift Spectrum, we can load it straight up from an S3 bucket without actually loading it into a data warehouse. What I want you to think as a developer today is don't treat data analytics as a silo, as something that someone else for you is doing. I just mentioned earlier, a changing force is that we should be all responsible about the data analytics pipeline. We as a developer, we should hook that into our application. Because data analytics is great for reports, great, right? I know what's going on in the past. But what you actually expect as an end user, I want to have a personalized experience in every app that I use. How do I do a personalized experience? My app needs to talk to my data lake, to my data analytics pipeline. I need to know who a user is. So think about how you integrate it into application, and think about how you can potentially react in real time to any feedback that comes to your application. And if you drive that then further, obviously it goes into the direction of machine learning. Right? The more insights you get, the more you can build models around it, and the better you can predict what a certain person can do. I can cluster, classify certain behavior, and understand and personalize an application better for someone. And I would go this far that machine learning is actually the new normal. Any company should be doing machine learning because it has become incredibly easy to get access to the latest and greatest machine learning tools and frameworks, and there are great frameworks out there, Cafe, MXNet, PyTorch, Keras and Gluon, which are interfaces to some of these other frameworks. And why do we do that? Because it allows us to create better customer experiences. It allows us to potentially be more effective, reduce the waste, Right? increase our efficiency in the company, in our supply chain, or even build complete new business models. Right? If you think about companies like Netflix, they're a data science company. They have a subscriber base. Right? They want to retain users. And if they can give you better recommendations, you're more likely to stay on the platform. That means you can grow your user base, which means you increase your revenue. That's only possible if I give you good recommendations. So it's part of the business model. And machine learning is easily accessible for any developers nowadays. If you haven't had a look at Amazon SageMaker, I really encourage you to do so. Because what Amazon SageMaker allows you to do, it allows you to build, train, and deploy a machine learning model. But let me dive in a little bit further. What do I mean with deploy? Well, what that means, it gives you an HTTPS endpoint of a trained model, which you can now integrate into any applications that you have. Now, if, if you want to learn a little bit more about that, at 12.20 in room two later, we're going to have a session that dives into this in more detail. Now, if I say you can train models with Amazon SageMaker, you can build any models that you like. You can use the different frameworks and build any models that you like. But maybe you say, well, look, I, I'd love to do that, but I'm not entirely sure how data science work. Right? And I'm not entirely sure how those machine learning models and algorithms work. SageMaker comes with built-in algorithms, no matter if it's clustering, modeling, right, principal component analysis, image classifiers, object detection. Those are computer vision models, sequence to sequence, linear learners. We got the ability to detect text, understand text, natural language processing algorithms. But the interesting point about all of these, you don't need to write that algorithm. 
All you need to supply SageMaker is the data that you want to train the model with. And out comes a model that has been trained on your data point. And now you can either way say, I take that model and push, put it wherever I want, on any device I want to put it, or I can say, SageMaker, please deploy it for me. And you get a RESTful API endpoint, an HTTPS endpoint that runs that model. And what that means for you now, now you can take any application that you want. And you make a call against that API, and you make a prediction. That's how easy it is. So these are new ways of us really thinking about developers. Great, let's just do machine learning. Right? Don't be afraid of it. It's a lot easier than, uh, than you might think it is. I, I personally am guilty of it because I always felt like it's this complex data science thing. You know? And then during our Sydney summit, somebody challenged me for our keynote, just built like a computer vision model to detect objects. And I said, come on, that's tough. I did it, and it, it turned out it wasn't that difficult. Tools are available right now. The key point is we abstract. Frameworks help to abstract difficult concepts. And APIs help to integrate it into any application, into any different devices that we have. What do I mean with that? Well, you know, you probably heard this story many times, but I think it's still important to tell it. In the olden days, we always thought about those big monolithic applications, one big server, one big application somewhere sitting around. Right? Hard to scale, difficult to maintain, difficult to push changes, especially if you have large development teams. So we came up with those ideas of splitting it up, Right? OK, let's split that monolith up. How do we do that? Well, we, we, we take the core components, split them up into different functions. How do these functions talk to each other? Well, they talk to each other using APIs, RESTful APIs. Initially, we had SOAP and XML and those things. Wasn't performing so well. Then we said, OK, how about REST? RESTful APIs that use JSON. That works pretty well. And it allows us to really now say, all these core functions, I split them up and I develop them individually. I can iterate independently now on that function. That's great. And I just integrate it via an API call. Now, what that then translates into is that I build a structure of many different microservices, if you will, with all the different functions. The key point here is the development teams will work on those individual microservices independently. Different developers, different frameworks that we might want to use, different data stores that we might want to use, but more importantly, different SLAs that we can create around the microservices that we built. Certain microservices get hit harder than others. Now you can scale independently. Certain microservices or certain functionalities of your, of your application might be internet-facing. Right? They might have very spiky patterns of traffic that comes through. Now you can scale independently. And yet, you remain independent also in the way you develop that individual microservice as a developer. So what does that mean in terms of AWS? How would we build that? Well, treat every AWS service as a component, as a building block that you can make part of your microservice and consume that AWS service that makes sense for that single function of that microservice that you're building. Different microservices will use different data stores. One might use DynamoDB, another one might use an Amazon Aurora database. Another service might use Amazon Kinesis or Amazon S3, et cetera. Choose accordingly and treat it independently. And choose that based on the service requirements that you have. Now, the other thing is you generally need a business logic in between the AWS services that you consume. So what do we put in there? Right? We need something for that business logic. So I'd say break that business logic up into it, its individual functions and then look at AWS Lambda and Use AWS Lambda to build that, that business logic and its independent functions. And what that also allows us to do, it allows us to build event-driven asynchronous architectures. Right? If something happens, we activate the right Lambda functions. They run our business logic, our code, and it activates other AWS services as they require it. I need some data, I grab it from DynamoDB. I need some files, I grab it from Amazon S3. If something lands in Amazon S3, it might trigger another logic. You build an event-driven architecture. And if you use AWS Lambda, the beautiful thing here, first and foremost, it scales to any event throughput. It removes that element of, how do I scale this? Lambda now takes away that, that heavy lifting from you. It scales automatically. And most importantly, well, if there's no activity, Lambda shuts down. There's no cost to it when it's running idle. That's powerful. 
because it removes a lot of that heavy lifting for us as developer away. Just focus on our business logic. Now, what does change for me, though, as a developer if I do that? Well, the first thing is very positive, right? Reduced focus on keeping the lights on. I get inherent scale to AWS Lambda. It just scales for me because I now develop in a parallel fashion, and it's fault tolerant. It automatically distributes itself across multiple availability zones and runs as such. You don't need to think about how do I do HA, high availability. It just does. But more importantly, this new microservice strategy for me means I can run polyglot. I can choose different data stores and different programming languages according to my microservice requirements. And especially also the SLAs that I wrap around it and the scale that I require. So microservices are totally fine with data stores that don't scale well because they just don't have to, but others certainly don't. That strategy allows us to do it correctly. But the other thing that I'm really excited about is as a developer, I can iterate a lot faster because I'm independent on, in my microservice. And if I do it with something like AWS Lambda, there's really very little collateral to this now, right? Because AWS Lambda functions, if they don't run, they don't cost me anything. If I use that microservice strategy with the right AWS services correctly, I can run at a very cost-effective footprint, and that allows me to experiment with things without actually paying much for it, or it might even be free because it falls under the free tier. Now, the other benefit that comes from it is that microservices actually limit the blast radius of failures of software incidents, right? Error returns, slow response, if you have network partitions, if you implement it correctly. So think about a variety of strategies that you can use here as a developer. If you build a microservice, you can implement, for example, circuit breakers. Don't hammer a system if it's unresponsive. Wait for that system to come back alive, report that it's healthy, and then you talk to it again. That's a circuit breaker. Implement that pattern, great pattern. Bulkheads, what does that mean? Well, depending on what my application is doing, I can distribute it to different parts of my system. Ditto, I like that one. Do idempotent things to others. Whatever you do in your microservice, what you expose as an API should be idempotent for the other person that consume it, consumes it. It's okay for you to do whatever in your data stores that you want and find your own strategies of doing it. Right? But whatever you expose, it should be an API, and I should always get the call and the response that I expect as an outsider of my microservice. And the other very important thing, because microservices run independently, sometimes your flow of a microservice starts somewhere, calls another microservice, calls another microservice. Now something fails down the line. Now, you might need to roll back. So you need to roll back across different microservices. But now it's independent teams. You can't control it well anymore, right? You can't just say, roll back in a database, right? Traditionally, we just said, roll back database, done. Problem solved. we got microservices now. That's not possible. So when you build a microservice, always avoid any update and delete semantics. What I mean with that is, if you update something, like a request comes in, you update a field in your database, don't overwrite the existing field because you can't roll back that way. Use event sourcing or CQRS where you say, I have an event lock of what happened. And if somebody says, I need to roll back, no problem. I roll back to what was there five seconds ago. Never delete the data points and how they changed. Always know exactly how they changed. So if a microservice down the line tells you you need to roll back, you can do so. The other thing, I talk about AWS Lambda. Right? AWS Lambda allows us to run completely serverless. That's awesome, because it allows us to abstract away the complexity of running and scaling and making service highly available for our systems and platforms. Now, if you use serverless, I would also encourage you to look at some of the frameworks out there. There are many different frameworks. There's serverless, APAC, APAC, APAC oh, there we go. Uh, there's also the serverless application model. Sam, this little guy over here, that's the logo. Love it. What SAM allows you to do, it allows you to define your serverless applications. It's a, it's a YAML syntax, clean, simple, easy, right? And then it can build up all your dependencies using AWS CloudFormation. It does that for you. You just define a template, and then you say, okay, SAM, deploy that out for me, creates the right things for you, the S3 bucket, the Amazon DynamoDB table, et cetera, and then deploys a function, and off you go. You get an endpoint, and you can run it. 
The other thing that we introduced is the, the SAM CLI. Now, it's a command line tool, but it has one really cool function, which allows us to also test our serverless functions locally using Docker on our devices. This is an iteration that came from a lot of customer feedback. When we launched AWS Lambda in 2014, a lot of our customers said, that's awesome, but you know, I always need to be kind of connected to internet to deploy my function, and I need to push it to try it. And we said, that, that's a very fair point, very valid. So now we can test it locally. So you can test it, try it out, and you can even generate sample events. Oh, there was a DynamoDB table that was written to. There was a file that was dropped into an S3 bucket. You test all of that fully locally, and when you're happy with it, you can deploy it. And with the CLI, by the way, a simple command can help you to deploy it out into the stack of your choice. Again, if you want to know more about this, 11.40, we got a session in room two that dives in further in more details here. And now you might say, OK, I like Lambda, but sometimes I actually do want containers. That's all right. I understand that. Containers are great. Actually, AWS Lambda is a concept of where we manage containers for you in the end. But what if you want a little bit more control? There are services such as the Amazon Elastic Container Service, ECS in, in short, as we call it, that allows you to have a fully managed container control plane. Right? You decide on how you built your cluster, and then you can deploy your containers out. And if you say, I actually want to do that with Kubernetes, no problem. Choose Amazon EKS, which is the Amazon Elastic Container Service for Kubernetes. It's a mouthful, so I call it EKS. And the other thing that I would say is, in certain scenarios, you say, well, that's great, but you know what? I want to have control of my containers, but I don't care about the underlying EC2 instance, my cluster that I'm running on. Right? Can you do that for me? Of course, we can. AWS Fargate allows you to run your containers without caring about any of the underlying infrastructure. You don't need to define any EC2s or clusters or any of that stuff. You just push your container out, runs. Awesome. Awesome for me as a developer because I don't need to focus on the, on the underlying components. I can focus on my business logic, on my code. There are two sessions today at 11 and respectively at 2.30 and respectively room one and room two that dive a little bit in further into containers and also how you do that with .NET if you're a .NET developer. So attend those sessions if you're interested in more details. The other thing that I'm excited about is open source in general. You know, there's a, a thriving community of many different projects that are available and a plethora of frameworks that really help us abstract very difficult concepts. Just earlier, I talked about machine learning. There are frameworks out there that help, uh, help me to abstract very complex models with just a few lines of code, an entire thriving open source community that helped me extend that. And sometimes we think too much about which tool should I use. You know, is this the right framework? Is that the right framework? You know, and sometimes we get into conflicts with fellow developers on which framework is better and faster and easier to use. I would say if you adopt a microservice strategy, don't worry too much about it. The cost of experimentation is really low, and that goes all the way down to the frameworks that you're using. You can interchange frameworks in your microservices as you want. You expose APIs. You don't have an issue with the rest of the system. So experiment. Use the right framework. Use the right tool for the individual microservice that you're building. And so I want to give you an example of what I mean with it's so easy to build stuff. It's so easy if you have frameworks. Let's say I want to create an app. And I want to have that app being able to, or I want to be able to control that app with my hands. I just want to wave my hands. I want to be able to control that app. Now I can go ahead and say, OK, I could use computer vision, build that all myself, right? realize how my hands are working, and if I understand that, I can write an entire bunch of code around it on how I control my app using my fingers, using my computer vision model, and all of that stuff. And I create a camera. I need to integrate all of that. Sounds like a lot of work. So what I rather would do is I go out on the internet and search, you know, what, what kind of controller do I have out there that could help me potentially recognize my hands? And what kind of framework out there could help me bring that into JavaScript? And then I just need to think about that integration. So let's try that out here in a live demo. So what I brought here with me is a leap motion controller. And a leap motion controller is really cool because it has two infrared cameras right here. And those infrared cameras basically allow me to potentially track my hands uh, with a computer vision model that runs on my laptop. So if I activate this leap motion controller here, 
and I bring up my visualizer. You can see that we have an infrared camera here that comes out. Hello. And if I now put my hands over it, you can see that I actually have my hands being detected. Let me just remove that frame here. You can see this is really fast. I can identify my fingers. I can draw things up here. And I now have basically a module for me to understand movements that I do with my hands <laughs> up here without touching anything. All right, that's great. So we got the tool. Now, the next thing that I would say is now I want to build an application with it. You know, there, are, there are different kind of SDKs that we get for that Leap Motion Controller. And there are also open source tools out there. One is called Leap.js, right, which is a JavaScript framework that allows me to tap onto my Leap Motion Controller. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to load up an S3 website, which runs basically that Leap.js, that JavaScript component, in my browser. And now if I point my finger at my screen, you can see that there's a red dot appearing to where I'm potentially. Ooh, we got a lot of light here, a lot of reflection. You can see that I point basically where I'm at. And if I were to make a move, obviously now it's not working, like every good demonstration. There you go. If I make a move, there's a lot of light coming down from here. I can actually interact with that system. Let's try that one more time. If I put my hand up here, here we go. I just changed my screen. That's pretty awesome. I can even point out here. Here's my Lambda function. Here's my API gateway. Here's my recognition. AWS Cloud here, here where we explain how it works. Let's try one more swipe. Whoop, swipe a bit more. All right, all right, that's cool. OK, go back, go back, go back, OK. Go back, 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 back for me. <laughs> there you go. That's pretty cool, right? So I use JavaScript. I control reveal.js, which is another really cool open source tool out here to build slideshows on my laptop, and all of that using just my hands. That's cool. Now you're going to say, OK, great, nice demo. right? You build a bit of a slideshow, waving things around, doing minority report style here. The reason I show you this is because it's about extensibility. I didn't need to understand how that computer vision model worked. I didn't need to know how to build a slideshow in my browser. I didn't need to know how to co contact that leap motion controller. I just wrote a few lines of JavaScript to make this work for me. And I want to make that point about extensibility, because some of you might have attended last year's Dev Day here in Melbourne. And I had a little robot with me, a Sphero robot. And I controlled that Sphero robot using AWS IoT. So it was roaming around here on stage. And at the same time, I was controlling a virtual world in my cloud environment with a virtual robot. And as that robot was roaming around, the physical robot was roaming around here on stage. And so I thought, well, you know, let's extend things, because we can. So wouldn't it be cool if I could control my robot using my hands? Just swipe it around and control my robot. Extensibility, right? I now have my Leap Motion Controller. I got my Leap.js, awesome, JavaScript. I know how to do that. Now I just need to integrate it with AWS IoT. I already have the Sphero integration, which, by the way, I did last year using another great open source library called Silent.js. And then I'm going to introduce one more thing. I'm going to create an AWS IoT rule. And I say, any movements that I now do with the robot, also log them down into an Amazon DynamoDB table. Why do I do that? Because now I can build a machine learning model around it that would use reinforcement learning, for example, to understand what way the robot should roll around. The key point here is those are all individual components that talk to each other with the respective frameworks. Let's try that out. So, all right. So, first and foremost, let me just bring up my right screen here, clean up my interface a little bit. Now, we got my Sphero here. For those of you who haven't seen it, it's a translucent little device. This is an SPRK Plus Sphero. It's a small little robot that we control using Bluetooth. And I connected that also via AWS IoT. Now, let me bring up my AWS IoT console here. Do a little refresh here. The console died on me. There you go. Come on. And I'm going to listen to my Sphero topic. Make this is a little bit bigger. There you go. And I'm going to boot up my Sphero. Let's load this guy up. See if we got a. We can just show my screen also on the other side. 
Starting my device, Vero. Lots of Bluetooth interaction here. There we go. Now it came up. Hello, Sphero. Please put on up. Hello. Hello, Sphero. All right, great. Now, you can see also on, uh, on the left side here that we have actually AWS IoT messages coming through. So the next thing that I'm now going to do is I'm going to actually put my hand over my leap motion go, controller. Go, go, go. And if I now go say, let's go left, oh. we roll left. Stop. If I go up and down, I can stop it. If I go right, stop. Forward, stop. Go back, stop. How awesome is that? I control the robot with my hand. Stop, left, and stop. Awesome, right? How cool is that? Thank you. Now, the other thing that I've done here is I said, OK, now I can control my robot with my hand with just a few lines of JavaScript code. Cool. But the next thing that I also said is I want to learn on how I control that robot around. So how would I do that? Well, all of these messages come to AWS IoT, right? You saw here that I get these messages that are coming through with leap motion controller told me to roll backward, roll left, et cetera. So how do I bring them into a DynamoDB table? Well, in AWS IoT, all I need to do is I click on Act, and I can create an AWS IoT rule. Now, I created a Sphero logger rule where I said, whenever you get a message from Sphero where it says rolling, just insert that message into a DynamoDB table. Let's go to my DynamoDB table. Here's my Sphero log DynamoDB table. And I'm just going to hit refresh here, and you see here are the movements that I just did at this specific point in time. If I open this up, I can see that I got a payload that was specifically saying roll forward from leap at this point in time. And now I can inject that potentially into a machine learning model where I would learn how I'm controlling a robot around, put it into a reinforcement learning model, and let the robot roll on its own. How cool is that? I'm just going to put my sphere back. Thank you. Let's go back to the slides. Yep. So the few things and the few motions in effect here, because I like to talk about abstraction and integration here, is first and foremost, use open source frameworks that are out there that help you solve a certain problem. It abstracts complexities. I don't know how leap motion works. I don't know how the robot works. The frameworks help me. Think about integrating with the right APIs or the right message broker. AWS IoT was my message broker here. And the other thing, AWS services can nicely be integrated together. I just created a rule in AWS IoT, and it automatically did that integration with DynamoDB. I didn't have to write any line of code to make that work. I literally clicked it together in a browser. When I say abstraction and integration, this is how we want to think about it. Think about microservices, and within that microservice, think about the right frameworks and open source tools that you want to use, and think about the right AWS services that you want to use, and how you can plug them together to make it work. Now, the next thing that I want to talk about is the pace of innovation. What do I mean with that? Well, our CEO, Andy Jesse, he always likes to say, you know, invention requires two things, the ability to actually try a lot of experiments and not having to live with the collateral damage of those failed experiments. Experiments. What does he mean with that? Well, if I can experiment without too much cost and quickly do it, I can innovate generally faster. And so what are my strategies here? Well, the first strategy is I want to empower the teams to be able to experiment with our microservice concept or by splitting up individual teams and giving those teams the power to individually experiment, we can move faster. Cloud computing removes the cost component, right? I can use AWS Lambda functions or even just any of the other cloud services and run completely on demand, only pay for what I use when I use it, allowing me to drop down the cost of any experimentation. The other thing that I would say, and that's really important, automate anything you can automate. What do I mean with that? If you build code, create the correct CI, CD pipeline, continuous integration and delivery. What does that mean? Use services, if you want to use AWS services, use services like CodeStar, CodeCommit, CodeBuild, CodeDeploy, CodePipeline. What it allows me to do is, as I'm ready for code to go live, I check it in, I commit it, it automatically gets built, the dependencies are injected, and then I can 
deploy it out using my pipeline into a Lambda function, deploy it out to my EC2 instances if I want to use EC2 instances. But all of this should be fully automated. If I'm ready to, for my code to be deployed, I just hit a button to, do, to commit it, and the rest should be a pipeline. The other thing is treat any infrastructure, any service that you use in AWS as code. With CloudFormation, you can bring things up and down with just a template. If you use AWS SAM, the serverless application model, right, all the resources, the tables, the databases, the S3 buckets, whatever, are brought up as you require them. But most importantly, when you did your experiment, you can either way choose, OK, that wasn't what I wanted to do, tear it all down with one command. Or alternatively, say, that's good. Let's kind of move it into production. And the other thing is, monitoring and logging is really important. There are services like X-Ray that can help you understand how does my code run in my Lambda function? Where do I have bottlenecks? CloudWatch allows me to understand what's the load on it, what are the things that are happening? CloudTrail, Config, all allow me to understand what's happening at any point in time. Do that from day one, because that helps with your experimentation. I'm guilty myself to just go into that console, go to Lambda, create new function, type everything in, and I'd be like, test it, and it doesn't work, and I copy-paste things back and forth. If I have a proper pipeline, I can experiment so much faster. So build that up. If you want to know how that works, at 2.30 later in room one, uh, we're going to look at how we can build a CI-CD pipeline even across different AWS accounts. And so the other thing that we have about the pace of innovation is that if you use AWS, you continuously get new functionalities every single day. How awesome is that? And that, that pace of innovation is increasing. If you look at the past years on how we accelerated these launches that we do every single day, you get access to new capability every morning you wake up. Be aware of them and use them as you see fit. Now, I thought let's talk a little bit about that rapid pace of innovation. And so I figured who would be a good person to talk best about this? And so we have this person called Jeff. Jeff Barr, he has been in Amazon since 2002. He's been with AWS from day one. And so I figured, let's hear from Jeff on how he handles that rapid pace of innovation. So it's my absolute pleasure to invite up on stage Jeff Barr, our VP and Chief Evangelist within AWS. Jeff? Really good to have you here. Let's have a little bit of a fireside chat, shall we? Because I, I, I think our audience wants to hear from you how you have been an Amazonian for so long. And Great demo, by the way. Oh, thank you, thank you. A lot more to come. Now, Jeff, I think our audience has the same question I do. What's up with that purple hair there? All right, good story. So purple has always been my color since I was a kid. I'd wear a purple jacket or purple socks, and people say, hey, that's, that's your color. And as my hair transitioned from, from dark to light, I occasionally would threaten to say, you know what, I'm just going to dye my hair purple. And my children and my wife didn't quite take me seriously, and I don't think they were really big fans of the idea. And last year, I was negotiating with a team at Amazon for a delivery date, and they were somewhat indeterminate on the date, and I really wanted the feature they were working on. And I, out of desperation, I said, OK, June 15th, if you get it done, I will dye my hair purple as a thank you. And suddenly it went from indeterminate, we might be able to do it, to, OK, we're going to get it done for you, Jeff. And I don't <laughs> think they took me seriously, but, but I took myself seriously. They did their part, I did my part, and I figured might as well keep it around for a while. <laughs> I love that interesting culture, right? That's how you push for delivery data, <laughs> dyeing your hair. OK, am I next? Am I next? So Amazon, Amazon has been around for a long time, but you have been around for a long time too, Jeff. Huh? You joined us nearly 16 years ago, and you saw that entire explosion and rapid innovation, the pace of innovation that we have with Amazon and AWS itself. Uh, you know, my question to you is, how do you keep up with all of this? You know, you have your blog and everything. How do you keep up with all of these things? I've successfully fooled you, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think one thing that comes about with, with experience and with age, and I, I know that we're in a very youth-oriented kind of a, of a field. Everybody thinks when you're in your 20s that you're actually the best at doing tech. And I think what happens with, with age and experience is you, you, you get to really figure out what are the important aspects of everything you do. And so you, I look at a brand new service, and I'll see 20 or 30 different possible bullet points, but I can 
take a look at that and then say, let me pick the three, four, that to me are the, the ones that really stand out, and then focus on those, and really just take those as the highlights. So being able to zoom in, pick the, the right things is first. And then the other thing is I love to get hands-on experience. We, I, if you see in anything I've written that says, I did this, and I did this, and this happened, none of that is fake. That's all things I did myself and all experience. So hands-on learning to me has always been really valuable. And that, that, I think, helps to really connect the dots and make it really clear what's happening. And you can read all you want and say bullet point one, two, and three, but open up the console, give it a shot, write some code, make it happen. That, to me, has always been a, an essential part of keeping up and, and of learning. Ah, that makes sense. Um, uh, that's one of the reasons I always like to build those demos. There's so many learnings that come out of it. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. But so, Jeff, I was talking about microservices just earlier and, and you know, abstractions and how beautiful it is to have the ability to run polyglot, right, run different programming languages in your, in your microservices. Uh, what, what's your take on that? What do you think about it? I think it's absolutely essential. Occasionally, I'll talk to a startup, and they're starting with empty repos, and they say, we've decided we're a, a, a JavaScript shop, or a Python shop, or a Go shop, and we're building everything from scratch, and we're just designing everything in a single language. That is absolutely the exception. In most cases, they've got some code from here and some code from there, and they acquired another company, and they merged a couple different divisions together. They've got a pretty disparate collection of languages in their code base. And the reality is that if you hide everything behind microservices, that implementation language really don't, doesn't matter all that much. I, I look inside of the way we build services at Amazon, and mm. there, there is no global organization that says, you must use this framework, and you must use these languages, and you, you must build it in a particular way. Every service team at AWS has the freedom to choose the implementation technology that works the best for them. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I, I like how we iterate uh, also internally that way, as you mentioned. Uh, I think it's, it's just a, a rapid pace of innovation that we can get that way, too. And, and the other thing that I was showing is, is just open source. I love open source, right? You know, you can collaborate with people. You can deploy a project out. People look at it. It's, it's interesting. And you, you, you can just integrate things into your projects. What, what, what's your take on, on open source, Jeff? So watching as you were describing your demo, the first thing that really struck me when you said, I'm, I'm going to set out to make this happen. You didn't say, I'm going to start with a, a whiteboard and start writing mm -hmm. some code. Or you didn't open up your IDE. You didn't open up your editor. You said, I'm going to go out and search for something. Yeah. So this is a widespread availability of things other people have, have built already for you, essential part of our community now. To me, open source really goes back to our first leadership principle, which is? Customer obsession. Customer obsession, of course. So, Open source to me is, is even a step beyond customer obsession to customer participation. We've got customers that look at our documentation, our, our tools, our SDKs, our, our public data sets. And they look at all those and they say, this is pretty neat, but I can make it a little bit better. And they'll either go in and they'll, they'll send us a pull request with, with a, a little patch or a, a big feature added in, or they'll submit an issue. And that customer participation really gives us some really great spotlights and says, these are the areas we need to focus on. These are the places where we can put a little bit more energy, the places where we need to do a little bit better of a job. So really a big fan. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so the other thing, though, you know, we, we're talking about our customers, right? I agree, customer obsession. I love the way we work backwards from our customers. We say, what does a customer appreciate? What does he want? And then we figure out the rest after that. What's the right tech stack? What's the right tools to use? What's the right framework, et cetera? Um, but talking about customer obsession, you know, I, 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 I talk to a lot of our customers out here in Asia Pacific, and, and sometimes my customers ask me, you know, Ollie, you know, should everything run in the cloud? What's, what's the right strategy here? Is everything going to be in AWS at some point? How, how does that work? You know, what, what's, what's your take on that? All right, so you saw Andy Jesse's uh, quotes at the beginning of, the, of our event. And one of Andy's favorite phrases, he says, in the fullness of time. And I'm sure if you ask Andy, he'd say, yes, in the fullness of time, almost everything will, will run in the cloud. I, to me, it's a little bit more nuanced in the sense that there's always going to be an incredibly rich set and getting better and better set of services available to you in the cloud. But I think that we need to also consider what you can do out on the edge. You look at things like our Snowball Edge, the ability to run Lambda functions there, the ability to launch EC2 AMIs there at the edge. And think of that edge as where you are really close to your data sources. Maybe you've got incredibly low latency. You've got maybe intermittent connections from, from the edge back to the cloud. So instead of thinking, I want to do the same things in the cloud and on-premises, 
think of that edge as you're very, very close to the action, and what can you do out there at the edge to make things easier once you get into the cloud? That's a very valid point. And, you know, again, I think, you know, if you just look at the Snowball devices, it was, again, interesting customer obsession and feedback here because a lot of our customers told us, can you put that Lambda in? Can you put an EC2 in? And now we got those capabilities. Exactly. <laughs> That's really funny. And so, Jeff, you told me an interesting story yesterday. <laughs> you said uh, you raised the rocket scientist. Is that right? Indeed. So you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. OK. So I'm, I'm the world's proudest dad, by the way. Um, I've, I've got five children. Thankfully, they're all grown up, and they're all out of the house and self-sufficient, which is always a huge moment for a, for a parent. And um, uh, my daughter, Bianca, she just turned 25. And my wife just happened to post a picture of Bianca to Facebook last week. Uh, do we have that picture? We, uh, we, that we picture. actually do. Let's bring that uh, up there. Yeah, she would be there mortified if I showed this picture. <laughs> but anyway. So um, as a parent, the thing that really worked well for me, I never actually forced any tech on my kids. I would always put interesting stuff in front of them and say, here's something kind of neat. You, you might actually in, enjoy this. And so here, this, this is, I guess, from 1994, 1995, and the really, really early PC in front there. <laughs> never, ever pushed any tech onto the kids. But they're growing up in a tech household. They couldn't help but, uh, but absorb a little bit of it. And uh, Bianca, when she was growing up, she was a gymnast, but then she um, uh, she went to college, the, she loved her astronomy class, and she decided, you know what, I actually want to be an aerospace engineer. And she got a degree in aerospace engineering, and from there she, she actually interned at NASA, and she interned at Boeing. She now works at Blue Origin, and I was so, so actually shocked to find that some of her code was on the, the Blue Origin rocket that went up last month. It's like, wow. Yeah. From, from there to code in space in 25 years, so. I, I reckon she already wrote that code right there. I she? think so. <laughs> the, the one thing I did for some of my kids was if they had to learn editor, it had to be Emacs. It could not be VI. <laughs> that was the one thing I insisted on. Is she still using Emacs? That's a Absolutely. big question. Yes, she is. I, actually, I think it's <laughs> MATLAB and R that she uses more. So. Oh, there you go. OK. <laughs> but what an amazing story. I, I think it's, it's so interesting to see you know, what you grow up with uh, just, just inspires you. And you know, talking about inspiration, Jeff, uh, who is actually your inspiration? Mm. Who, who, who does inspire you? Wow. OK. So. You asked me this in advance, and I gave it a ton of thought, and the answer actually surprised me. So, so my wife and I live in Seattle, and we live on this little hill, and down the hill from us is this really cool philanthropic, philanthropic organization called the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And mm -hmm. I never thought I would say that, that, that Bill and Melinda would actually be the answer to my question, yeah. but, but Bill in his philanthropic mode is incredibly impressive. The, the work that the foundation has done to identify causes, to say we're going to go out and we're going to help with um, preventing diseases, we're going to improve health, mm. we're going to, and we're, they're, they're not just sitting in their ivory tower writing billion dollar checks and sending them out, they're, they're incredibly um, focused on improving outcomes and all these, and I, we often go to lectures at the Gates Foundation, and we get to hear directly from the researchers, and they say, we, we identified an issue, and we went and we, we invented something brand new, and we figured out a way to get it from, from the, the nice, clean clinical conditions in the lab out to dusty, dirty, hot environments where things aren't necessarily quite so sterile and perfect. And it, it's, it's super inspiring just to hear that that's the way they are. They're, the, the same mental rigor that Bill used to build Microsoft is now being used to, to go out and improve the world. So Bill and Melinda yeah. are certainly uh, big heroes of mine. Uh, that's amazing. And I, I fully agree. I, I think it's nice to sometimes step out of your comfort zone and really see what's out there. And, uh, it's, it's great. It's great. So Jeff. Purple hair, purple Jeff. Mm -hmm. Hashtag purple Jeff. Absolutely. Now, Jeff is going to roam around the event, and I know you're not a shy guy. <laughs> so I encourage everyone of the audience here today, please feel free to grab Jeff. Jeff, he loves to talk to our customers, loves to hear his stories. But more interestingly, he also loves to take a selfie with mm -hmm. you. So we created a little frame here. Uh, hashtag purple Jeff, and I all encourage you to go out there, find Jeff, take a selfie with Jeff, because we run a little competition. At the end of the day today, I want to find the most interesting pictures that we have with Jeff and our customers Excellent. and audience. Out so here. those need to be tweeted with that hashtag? Is that the absolutely, idea? Uh, absolutely. If you want to tweet it, hashtag purple Jeff, hashtag AWS day, choose your hashtag that you want to use. Find Jeff. Uh, he's happy to talk to you about anything of your interest. And uh, Jeff, I'm, I'm so happy you could make it up here. You're going to stay with us throughout the day. So please feel free to find Jeff and ask him anything you'd like. Sounds good. Oh, Hi. just one, one quick note. You Tell me. The, the, your infamous phrase, 
Just yeah. a few lines of JavaScript. That's, just a few lines of JavaScript. I should make that for, one. Yeah. For better or for just worse, that's <laughs> how fortunes are made. And sometimes a, a one-minute project turns into a one-year project. But there that's you go. right. That's right. <laughs> thanks for pointing that out. Never thought about that. So, all right, uh, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks so much for coming. Really appreciate you coming down here to Melbourne. And by the way, first time ever for him to be here. So, Absolutely. catch Jeff. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>
onto our home screen, just like any other app, but you actually control it with a backend that runs using web services. And I mentioned earlier, a lot of it is moving towards web standards. And I would say even the IDEs. I mentioned earlier there are IDEs out there that can create complete 3D experiences. Amazon Sumerian, for example, is a service that allows you to create virtual reality, augmented reality experience, and 3D experiences completely in and within your browser. You drag and drop things together and create your 3D world right there. But what for us as a developer? In the future, I would argue that more and more we will see cloud-based IDEs being used. Cloud9 is one of those cloud-based IDEs, AWS Cloud9, that allows you to write and run and debug your code right within your browser. Now you're going to say, OK, Oli, why do you say that? And I would say, well, there, there are a few moving factors here. The first one is your IDE is now close to potentially where your data sources sit, uh, and making potentially that development a lot faster, especially if we talk about things like I mentioned earlier, data is growing fast, right? So I don't need to download things, bring it to my laptop, et cetera. It also allows me to not care from a security standpoint of view if I lose my laptop while well, all of that data still sits in the cloud and my code is there too, so that's great. Okay, cool. But what I'm really excited about is collaborative coding. You've probably heard of pair programming, right? I sit in front of my computer, somebody looks over my shoulder and is like, ah, that doesn't sound good, that doesn't sound right, let's change it around, etc." That can be really useful. I don't know about you, but I had those moments where I sit on a piece of code, simple piece of code, right? And I just can't get it right. Things are, are failing, and I debug it, and I can't figure it out. And then you, you walk away, right? And you talk to someone about it at the coffee machine. You're like, I'm writing this code. I just can't figure it out. And he's like, let me have a look. He comes over, and he's like, ah, you forgot this little irregular expression here. It has a slash too much. That's your problem, right? And he's like, ah, oh, of course. We all had that moment, right? With something so stupid that we, we did something so stupid, we couldn't figure it out. Somebody comes along and we figure it out. As a matter of fact, earlier here, I came to the demo desk, I plugged in my network connector, and nothing worked. I couldn't get internet. I was like, what's going on? We called up the, the venue here, they brought the, they brought the network technician over, he plugged into his laptop, he's like, it works. I'm like, yeah, but look, I, I do a trace route here, it goes to the router, there's the first hop, and then it dies. It must be a router. And he's asking me, did you put in a manual IP into your laptop, a static IP? I go like, no, 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 I have DHCP. I click on my network preferences. I'm like, whoops. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Wasting your time for 20 minutes debugging the network connectivity. We all have those moments. And so collaborative coding really helps us, and pair programming helps us to tap onto the broader knowledge of our, of our peers to understand code and see where problems are. And that becomes really difficult when we don't sit in the same office. But if we have a cloud IDE and with AWS Cloud9, we can actually do that collaborative coding in our browser. Other people can look at our code. We see what they are looking at. We can do edits together. And it allows us to do pair programming, even if we sit in remote places in the world. Which leads me to the point of distributed computing, right? Things are being connected, but things are not all in the same place. So what is changing for me as a developer? Well, a, a few moving forces again here. The first one is we have an increased amount of devices that are being connected. OK, our mobile phones or tablets, but there are IoT devices out there. right? We have locks, we have cameras, we have all kinds of devices that are suddenly being connected. And that's great, because it allows us to build certain ecosystems around those connected devices. Right? Because devices traditionally might have served a single purpose or a single application, but moving forward, applications or devices that we're creating will have multiple purpose through the ecosystems that we have. For example, if you take an Amazon Echo device, it collects to the, uh, connects to the Alexa voice services. But what makes it so powerful is that any developer can integrate their kind of tools, their company, into those Alexa voice services, right? Uber did that, for example. Now I can use my voice to call an Uber. How cool, how cool is that? Key point here is the more we have connected devices and different companies use different APIs to connect with each other, we can collaborate accordingly and build an ecosystem around it. And the other moving force is we have more and more of a global user base. Traditionally, I might have wrote, written code. I have moved it somewhere in a computer. Right? It sits somewhere in an office, and that's it. Nowadays, we expect any applications that we're building to be able to potentially 
be accessible globally by a global user base. But it gets worse, the global user base actually wants to interact with each other. Why do I say it gets worse? Because there's, however, one thing that hasn't changed, which are the laws of physics, right? Latency is bound by physical distance, right? If I go from Australia here to the US, there is latency. There's just that physical distance that's there. So how do we do that? That's not easy if we develop code that works across the world. So I want to give you a few strategies here. The first one is look at your data stores, right? And try to think about how can I globally distribute my data stores? Because that will help me with a global user base where I still expect low latency. And talking about low latency, think about how could I potentially deploy my code closer to the edge location, maybe even closer to that device or that thing or that IoT thing that's out there when the app is latency sensitive. The other thing that I would say is, uh, you know, here in Melbourne, awesome 4G connectivity pretty much everywhere here, right? But I cover all of Asia Pacific. Sometimes I'm in very remote areas. Actually, I don't need to go Asia Pacific. I just stay in Australia, and I go a little bit into the outback, and suddenly I don't have good network anymore. Your application needs to gracefully handle those intermittent network connectivities. That's an important strategy to build in upfront from your app. Don't build an app that needs to be connected all the time. The user experience won't be good. And the other thing is caching. Always think about caching. So, what does that translate into? Let's go into those strategies. The first one is look at distributed data stores. Right? If you want to build distributed applications, you will have distributed data stores to a certain extent. What does that mean? Think about data stores like a database, for example. A relational database. Well, if you have a relational database, Amazon Aurora, for example, comes with a cross-region replication and multi-master write. So you can write into any different region that you want, and it will be globally distributed accordingly, and we can read from those different regions. So I can send an end user to a region that has the lowest latency for him and still read or write to that relational database store. And that same thing applies, obviously, also for non-relational data stores. If you use Amazon DynamoDB, you can enable cross-region replication. Global tables, we call it. By the way, global tables are available here in our Sydney region. Right? You create a DynamoDB table, say global table, and now you can say replicate it into those regions, respectively, automatically handled by us. And that allows us to build applications for global user bases. Because people travel, right? I might have a data store. Uh, I have an Australian user. He signs up. I put it into my DynamoDB table in Australia. What if he's, seen, if he's in the US? Now, you find that this replicates within milliseconds. I'm yet to see of how we fly over from Australia to the US in milliseconds, right? So that, that replication might take a little bit of latency, but that latency is irrelevant for your application. The key point is you bring the data store close to the end user. Sometimes that's object-based. Amazon S3, similar thing. Cross-region replication, you activate, you say which regions you automatically want your objects to be replicated, and it just happens. Now, how do I send the user, the end user, to the right location? Use Route 53. Route 53 has the ability to do things like geo-routing and so on, but use latency-based routing. It will automatically go to the region that has the lowest latency for your end user. And the other thing is, if you need a bit of additional logic, look at AWS Lambda. AWS Lambda can run at the edge for certain code logic. Lambda at edge, as we call it. And Lambda at edge allows you to run that code at our edge locations across the world. We route now the person to the close, sorry, not the closest, the edge location with the lowest network latency. Your code can run there, and it goes to the region with the lowest network latency, all with the help of Route 53. And I mentioned caching, right? Try to cache, or cache. I'm never sure if I should say caching, caching. Dif different opinions there. Uh, cache also at the edge. Use something like Amazon CloudFront, and obviously cache within your applications with things like Elastic Cache, Redis, et cetera. Now, this assumes that's my that I have a distributed data store of an application that is in complete control of myself. And by myself, I mean, obviously, me as a company or whoever builds the application. But sometimes you have a scenario where you say, I need a distributed data store across different companies without a central authority of trust. If and only if, when that's the case, look at blockchain. Why? Because that's a technology that allows you to build that distributed data store 
right, that can record transaction item potently without the need of a trusted central authority. Right? I can create a shared ledger, I have all the transaction, and they're immutable. I know how they changed over a period of time, and they're independently verifiable. This really helps me to build a distributed data store across the world, across different parties that might not have established trust between each other. And this becomes incredibly powerful when you integrate it, for example, with IoT. It allows you, for example, to track an entire supply chain across multiple providers that might not have a trust relationship established between them. Uh, if you want to experiment with blockchain, uh, we provide you with AWS blockchain templates. You can be up and running uh, within minutes. If you want to learn a little bit more about this, come to room one at 12.20, where we discuss a little bit on how we can develop smart contracts using Ethereum. Now I say, move the logic closer to the edge. The other thing that I'd say is look at things like AWS Greengrass. Sometimes you're in environments, especially in Australia, for example, you have, you, know, you have a mining industry, you have places that are very remote, you get oil rigs out there, and I still need the ability to have some logic being deployed in those remote locations because connectivity is intermittent, connectivity might be expensive because I need to go via satellite. Now, I still want to have the ability to write code central in a cloud environment and, and bring some of it back to my cloud environment so I can perform analytics, etc. But I need also to have the ability to have any machinery that operates there to be able to operate and talk to other machinery in that location without the need to have an internet connectivity. This is the moment you apply AWS Greengrass, which is one of the components of AWS IoT. What it helps you to do is you can deploy a Greengrass core, which is a piece of software that you run at that edge location. That edge location can be anything. Your office, your oil rig, your, your data center, whatever you want. All right. You want a piece of software there, and now what you can do is you can actually have AWS Lambda functions that you create, and you can deploy them out onto that edge location. That Lambda function can now run on that edge location based on events. What do I mean with that? You can now connect devices to it, any kind of IoT device, any devices that you want. It's talking MQTT at the edge locations now. These devices can talk to each other. You have the routing policies that are defined in a cloud, push through that edge, but also your Lambda function and your logic now sits there, and they can actually talk to each other, invoke those Lambda functions, maybe consolidate some information, and then push it to a cloud environment when I'm connected. It can synchronize later on as I connect. This allows me to do is have a local, sorry, a central place to build my code, my Lambda function, my logic, collect at the central place the most important information that I want to collect for further analytics, but then move some of that logic out to the edge so that latency-sensitive application or applications that might run in a disconnected environment can still talk. And talking about intermittent connectivities, also have a look at AWS AppSync. What AWS AppSync allows you to do is you can create web or mobile applications where you use GraphQL to define schemas, and that those data stores now run locally on that device, such as your phone, for example, and you can update them, and then they synchronize with my cloud environment. And they can handle offline connectivity, meaning if, for whatever reason, you lose internet connectivity, your application still works. You do whatever you want to do. Those data stores update locally on device. Whenever I regain connectivity, they're now synchronized with my cloud environment. AppSync handles all of that for you. So have a look at AppSync because that allows you to build those applications that are responsive because they're, they don't require connectivity to happen when you press a button. But you still have those collaborative user experience because when the connectivity is there, it synchronizes. And if somebody else does something, that response comes back to the device. But it always happens locally first, then syncs. That creates a responsive experience. Now, if you want to know more about this, at 3.10 in room two, we're going to dive a little bit further into how we build actually complete serverless web applications with React using GraphQL and AppSync to handle these kind of intermittent connectivities. So we talked about a lot of things. Let's, uh, let's try to bring this all together, shall we? And so I encourage you to participate in the next demonstration. So anyone who has a phone or tablet in their pocket, we're going to grab this one out now if you want. And I'm going to try to build a distributed demo, a demo that is portable to, the, to your devices, because we're going to use web standards. I'm going to deliver that demonstration to you via 
the ability of using Amazon CloudFront, using a natural location to quickly deliver content and code out to your devices. Uh, I'm going to build a 3D live experience here using Amazon Sumerian, which I designed within my browser natively using all these 3D components. I brought them together. And I'm going to use open source to abstract away the component and the complexity of augmented reality. Now, also, we'll have your phones connect to an AWS IoT experience so I can potentially switch around scenes. So I invite you to go to the URL that is typed in here, ardemo.sumerian.world, within your browser in your phone. And it will ask you for access to your camera, provided that permission. And I'm going to try to do the same now here on my device using a tablet. All right. So let's bring up everything here first. Nice controller. All right. So one other thing I haven't told you yet. If you look at your batch that you're having, you can flip that around. And we got a marker here, an augmented reality marker. All of you who should have a sticker on, on, your, uh, on your batch here. And so when you go to that URL, it will ask you, let's just put this out here. It will ask you for camera access. So if I load that up in my tablet, get this one up here. It will load an Amazon Sumerian experience. And as that Amazon Sumerian experience comes up, it's using AR.js to ask for camera access. And if that camera access is there, you can see that if I hover over that marker, we now see that there's a 3D object that is popping up completely within my browser. Now, if you're on your phone, you can also try to actually touch that 3D object here. And you should be able to move it around. Now, the other thing that I'm going to try to do is I'm going to use AWS IoT. I clicked here on the little component here to change my scene around. And now you should see that you all have a mannequin that actually pops up here uh, because I changed the scene using AWS IoT with all your connected devices. Now, Shall we make that mannequin dance a little bit? Let's, uh, let's play some music. Let's please play some music. I'm going to change to the next scene. And hey, there we go. We get our mannequin dancing around on a 3D object. You see it's really reactive, even to movements, running completely in my browser. And if I touch this mannequin, you can see that I can actually change its dance move. It's now doing a Macarena. For all of these from the 90s. Let's touch one more time here, another dance move, another dance move here, stepping around. How cool is that? A connected experience using augmented reality running completely within my browser. Awesome, right? All right, thank you very much. Now, if some of you had challenges with the camera, uh, if you have certain settings on your phone, you might not have camera access allowed by default. The interesting things here that we have is that we use a component of connectivity. You saw I could change that scene around using IoT. But more importantly, I delivered it out using a complete cached component in CloudFront. And I used an open source tool to actually help me build an augmented reality experience. And now you, you're going to say, OK, Oli, that, that's all cool. But you started this presentation with data centricity. And I don't see data centricity here because you don't listen to your customers. You just impose them with mannequins. And they can't even choose what they want to do. So you're not doing what you preach? Well, I think we can change it around a little bit. Let's try another augmented reality experience. But this time around, I want you to vote for colors. And for those of you who might have attended the AWS Summit in Sydney, I think it was in 2015, uh, my fellow colleague Glenn Gore, he demonstrated AWS IoT. And at that time, we built a little cube downstage that had LED lights. And the audience could actually vote for colors, right? different colors. And as they voted to the, for those colors, those colors would appear. Those LED lights would have the colors 
of the audience that voted for it. Perfect example for extensibility. I want to, I, I have that cube logic already, right? I asked Glenn, can you sh shoot me over that cube logic? Thank you very much. I deployed that CloudFormation template into my AWS account, brought up the correct AWS IoT services, and now I said, now I want to extend this with augmented reality experiences. So what we're going to try to do next is let's create a virtual art piece where we're going to have an augmented reality 3D cube that will have its colors decided by you, the audience, using a voting serverless app in your phone. So take out your phone, go to bit.ly slash AWS cube, and this will give you the capabilities of actually being able to vote for color. So as you see that color, you can tap it, and you will be voting for that color. Now, at the same time, what I'm going to do here on my screen, I'm going to bring up a little interface here. And that interface, wow, oh, <laughs> a lot of people are voting. I love this. You can see how the votes are coming in. And at the same time now, I'm going to create an augmented reality experience here. This runs off completely an S3 bucket, of course. That S3 bucket runs a few lines of JavaScript code. And if that comes up here, it allows me to get camera access. So now we got camera access here. Move this around a little bit. Oops, sorry. All right. All right. Hello. And now let's see if we can actually create that live 3D cube that you're editing as it's flowing through in an augmented reality experience. And you can see how you're actually voting and how these colors are now changing. And it's pretty reactive into the component of augmented reality, even if I dance around here with the cube. And obviously, this is, again, connected via AWS IoT. And the cube is voting and voting. Winning color, red. I love it. Red is my favorite color. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, I want to close up with a, with a few comments here. And I, I think it's always great to kind of try out those live demonstrations. Me, it, it helps me to understand how things are working better when I build it. And to Jeff's point earlier, Always experiment. Always try things out. It's easy to try things out. Cloud computing makes it cost effective. Microservice strategies make it easy for you to run it without collateral. So in closing, think about data insights. Data is that new gold that you have. Collect it. As a developer, own that process. Own the data insights. Right? The best platforms have good data analytics at its core, and you as a developer should not say, that's someone else's mission, that's someone else's problem. I give you log files, you figure it out. No. Integrate it into your app from day one. Use services like Kinesis, use services like Amazon S3, integrate against it. Right? Don't push a log file somewhere, write it into S3 in the right place. The other thing is, experiment quickly. Be ready to experiment. Innovation happens through experimentation. Microservice strategies, open source tools, frameworks out there, cloud services, they all are moving forces that help us to do it really cost effectively and fast. Experiment. Don't be afraid to choose the wrong framework. It's easy to change things around if you have the right microservice or the right API strategy. And the other thing is, don't be afraid to deploy your code globally. There are services that help you to do it. Right? Enable them, deploy globally, be happy with it. It's not that hard anymore. Cloud services and AWS make it easy for you to deploy globally, make it easy for you to have distributed global data stores. And if that's not enough, move it to the edge. Use Greengrass, use Lambda functions, use JavaScript functionalities in AWS IT, move things to the edge where it is necessary. Right? We're here to help, and if you find something that you say, OK, that's all good, but there's this one feature that I don't have. Tell us about it. We're happy to collect that feedback and start building and prioritizing our feature releases based on your feedback. And lastly, and this is really important, focus on your core business. No matter what your business, your startup, what you're personally doing, don't focus on that heavy lifting. Don't focus on 
building up servers, unless that's your core business. Don't focus on that. Leave the heavy lifting to someone else. And that's not only servers. That's open source frameworks. That's frameworks overall. Help contribute to those frameworks if you want. But start using frameworks. Don't always start from the ground up. Focus on its value to your business. Focus on that business logic. Write the code for that business logic. And see where you can use abstraction and, and integration using the right tools, the right frameworks to integrate it accordingly. And then, obviously, try to use web standards where you can so you can port it out into different devices. Now, with that, we got a day full of interesting and exciting sessions. Please attend the one that are interesting for you. We're going to dive really deep into the technical details of services and how to build those experiences accordingly. Please go out there and build great stuff. Thank you very much for your attention.